Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Open Door. Jim Hannock here with <clears throat> co-host Mario Ramos Reyes and good friend Curtis Hancock. Let's begin with a prayer. Yes. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful in the same Spirit. Help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 We're going to be looking at humanism and Christian humanism. And uh, our special guest, and we are delighted that he is returning, is Dr. Curtis Hancock. He's the coordinator of the Concentration in the History of Philosophy at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, Cromwell, Connecticut. He taught for 32 years at Rockhurst Jesuit University in Kansas City, Missouri. And for over a decade, he taught for Great Books Discussions, an online homeschooling program. Now, humanism... Well, it's an ism, and it's an abstraction, (laughs) and that doesn't keep it from being a reality, but let's try to pin it down, and and the first question I like to ask, and of course Mario is going to jump in any time he's so inspired, is, is this, what historically is humanism? Well, I should. I can take that up. Um, historically, humanism has different currents based on a way of understanding the primacy of being human. I guess, in a very broad sense, that's what humanism is—a a way of understanding why being human is so important, perhaps the most important thing in the universe. And as it's played out historically that really falls into two camps in light of what we mean by a human being. A human being, on the one hand, is part of the animal kingdom, the human animal, and that represents one current of humanism that has actually become manifest today in what we might call secular humanism, which very much aligned with atheism, and in a way makes a god out of the human being because there is no god otherwise. (laughs) But then there's another kind of humanism, I call that former type, that secular humanism, a kind of animalistic humanism. And it goes way back to ancient times, to the Greek animus and before, Um, just animals. But then there's another kind of humanism, which is personalistic humanism, that that human animal is also a person. And a person is special, species specifically special, and not reducible to just being an animal because we have the dignity of having a rational, you know, having a rational mind and free freedom of choice. And so in the history of humanism, you see personalistic humanism worked out, especially by religious thinkers and representatives of religion. And then you see the other kind of humanism, especially in modern times, played out against the background of a materialistic, mechanistic worldview. <clears throat> and which you have uh, uh, humanism being pretty much, as I said before, synonymous with atheism. When did did, uh, people start to talk about humanism? Well, um, the ancient Greeks, of course, were 
very much fascinated by it. Etienne Gilson wrote that tremendous book, The History, <clears throat> The Unity of Philosophical Experience, <clears throat> in which he said what the Greeks did, especially Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they formed what Gilson called the Western Creed, the idea that society should be understood from the vantage point <clears throat> of the specialness of the human person as having reason and thus having a dignity that goes with that. So you have the, those three secular philosophers, Plato, um, Socrates before, and Aristotle, who kind of set up um, some kind of deep philosophical explanation of what it is to be human. There's no saying that as goes your philosophy of the human person, so goes everything else in your philosophy. So they saw that. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle saw that. So going back all the way to the ancient Greeks there, you see whether you're a secular humanist or a religious humanist, philosophically you can give credit to them. From the standpoint of, of, um, of religious humanism, even before uh, the ancient Greeks, I think one of the great humanists of all time, one of the great personalist humanists was Abraham. That's a name that <laughs> one might not expect to come up in a conversation like this, because we're thinking more philosophically. My specialty has always been in the history of philosophy. But Abraham, I think, was one of the most important humanists, because what Abraham did was he radicalized the idea of revelation. <clears throat> revelation with Abraham was no more just a, an understanding of Christian doctrine, a body of of teachings that have been disclosed by God. Abraham took the step to say that God is a person, I'm a person, and what do persons do? Persons talk to each other. So Abraham said, I'm going to talk to God, and lo and behold, God answered back. And in the history of, of, relig of, of um, personalistic humanism, that's the idea. The person is someone to communicate with. That's what a person is. That's why in Christian teaching, God is a community of persons. There's no point in having one person. A person is meant to communicate with another person. <laughs> and so Abraham saw this and said that the, the covenant with my people is going to be a covenant started with a conversation with God. And that changes everything when you look at it that way. Now, I see that as a a powerful account of the development of humanism. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you know that a, a student in an ordinary Western Civ course is going to encounter <laughs> the term humanism in a very different context. Uh, humanism would Certainly. be seen as something that might have antecedents, depending on how generous your definition is, but there would be chapters, no doubt, whole chapters in, in uh, Western Civ textbooks with titles like The Rise of Humanism. Yes. And at that point, we could speak of people referring to each other as humanists, and uh, thinking of uh, this turn towards humanism as not the uh, legacy of Abraham, but something very different, something that they developed mm -hmm. and something that took them beyond the medieval period. And in that context, who, uh, who would be a humanist? Because that's the kind of context that most people are going to run into this, this term. <clears throat> Right. But, but if I may interject something that yes, um, sure. Jim is saying, referring humanism and the different meaning that you find in any uh, standard text of uh, Western Sea. There is another uh, term there that you just uh, mentioned, uh, Curtis, which is the term personalism. Right. And if you take any handbook, um, and I have in mind uh, a very standard handbook about personalism written by a Spaniard uh, president of the uh, Association of Personalists in, in, in Spain, uh -huh. he classified at least 10 or 12 schools of personalism. Uh, yeah. uh, for instance, he said, well, there is a dialogical personalism, the existentialist personalism, communitarian personalism, 
phenomenological personalism and ontological personalism and <laughs> and a few more. So when you say, well, it's an, uh, a humanist is personalist, the, the question is what type of personalism, personalism are we talking about here? Because there's mm -hmm. very different uh, understanding, if you will, of certain aspect of the human person. Yeah, certainly. And, and one, in all fairness, can do that. But I'm still thinking about being understood against the backdrop of what the ancient Greeks, uh, Plato and um, Aristotle and Socrates understood as human beings having dignity because of the, uh, I'm having some call come in here. <clears throat> um, can you still hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, certainly yes. can. I think I heard a ping. I think I heard a yeah. ping. From our good connected. friend John Breen. Is that right, John? Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Okay. Now, at some point, not not too far distant, we're going to ask you when you first heard of something called determinism. No, although it might lead to that, something called humanism. <laughs> when you first heard of this term humanism, and and in what context? But but we already have. Uh, 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 Dr. Hancock uh, explicating for us. Well, I was just saying that uh, I think what Dr. Ramos Reyes has said there is important, but I still think it all, it, there's still a basic family resemblance going back to how personalism was understood by the ancient Greeks, and it was reinforced by Christianity, by the church fathers, Augustine, and others. It's the idea that person human beings are unique we have a certain dignity because we can live a life of reason um, and in Christianity this was reinforced by the idea that human beings are actually a special creation made in the image and called to the likeness of God and God is a person this is what Abraham saw although he didn't have it in a Trinitarian context um, Abraham saw that God is a person and that in fact in Christianity, we understand that God uh, is a community of persons. And so, uh, you know, Aristotle years ago said that um, um, human beings are a zoon political. We are meant to live a life that's interconnected with others. And um, we can't live a human life unless we're socially enmeshed in some way. And so Christianity has reinforced that. And Western civilization, this is what Jill Sohn said, the Western creed is basically about that Greek vision of the human person reinforced and deepened by Christian theological wisdom. And um, what's happened in more recent times, in modern and contemporary times, is that's been deconstructed. We've um, taken the, the, the capital built up by the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian tradition of personalism, and it's been deconstructed, and that, and to a large extent, explains what is happening in society today, that deconstruction. So once upon a time we had an integral and basically theistic humanism, but now we have a mm -hmm. different sort of humanism, and right. it's a humanism that isn't so sure really what it is to be a human, much less what it is to be a human person. But now in terms of uh, the development or disarray uh, chronologically of the idea of personalism and humanism, in particular mm -hmm. humanism, I want to ask John, if somebody, oh, maybe some high school student that you'd run into, I mean, there are all those high school students around. Uh, if some high school student said, gee, could you tell me about humanism? I've just been reading something about humanism in my Western Civ textbook. Uh -huh. uh, what would be your first reaction, John? Uh, to be completely honest, uh, humanism is a term I haven't heard in a long time. And uh, so I'm... I, I think I came across it when I was studying in Canada, but I long since forgotten the term. So um, if I had to give my rather uneducated guess, I would probably say that it's uh, humanism is 
a belief on human authority as opposed to the spiritual one. And I would have to go back and study it again. That's kind of what I'm picking up in the, in the few minutes that I've been listening, but I, I haven't come across this term in a long time. Well, I suspect that, that most people from time to time will hear a reference to humanism, and I suspect that most people have pretty much the same reaction that, that you have. And if, if pressed, I mean, maybe somebody says, <laughs> Well, this isn't just any high school student. This is my nephew. I better go check out one of my books, uh, <laughs> and I'll get back to you, uh, dear nephew. That that in checking out your books, you might see humanism uh, in the same uh, chapters as the Renaissance, mm-hmm. or in the same chapters as. Uh, what really changed when we moved from feudalism to at least the uh, beginning of modern times? And, and it's there that the term humanism might come into play. And I think a lot of people would say, so let's see, what does that mean? Um, humans are really, really important and, uh, well, they're important in a way that they weren't thought to be important during the medieval period. And now I'm just doing a riff here, good friends, but if somebody said, well, you know, an example of a, of a culture that, that wouldn't be humanistic, well, uh, try Afghanistan. That's a, that's a <laughs> tribal mm. culture. That's really a tribal culture. It, yeah. Or... Think of Papua New Guinea. Uh, you go to Afghanistan, Papua New Guinea, people wouldn't have heard of humanism. You know, they wouldn't have heard of it and then forgotten about it. They wouldn't have ever really come across it in any, in any practical terms. And then somebody might say, which isn't to say that the people in, in Afghanistan uh, are are without any kind of religion, some of them would say that their lives are much more structured religiously than our lives are structured. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so oh, we'd have to do a sorting out mm-hmm. what counts as humanism, what doesn't count as humanism, and what are we contrasting it with. And one kind of contrast that we have with humanism, and, and Curtis has certainly underscored this, is we can contrast uh, humanism with a kind of uh, well, uh, deracinated, reductionist view of the human person, and we could call that secular humanism. But we could also contrast humanism with a kind of uh, tribalism, a kind right. of uh, a, a blindness to the whole range of the human experience and a, a narrow focus on the experience of one clan, say, that would be a contrast. Mm -hmm. And so, as with so many isms, as soon as we have the ism, we we start a sorting process. Uh, We mean by humanism this, but not that. And then someone says, oh, that's what you mean by humanism. Well, Mm -hmm. actually, by humanism, we mean that, but not the this that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, And so struggles begin. Yeah. Can I pose a question real quick here? Sure. Um, is humanism, is that like one of the terms that came out of the Enlightenment? You know, the belief, you know, like uh, shifting away from traditional slash spiritual authority and more focus on uh, the human rationality. Would that be an example? I think it's time for Curtis to get back in and <clears throat> direct us here. Yeah, I, I think that is has been kind of the, uh, the historical trend. You know, one of the great humanists is Erasmus. Ah, I was waiting. Novel. I thought I saw him out there somewhere. <laughs> and he wrote that book in praise of folly. But Erasmus thought that the, the, the a genuine humanism, what later someone like Mary Tam would call a true or integral humanism, was a humanism that was animated by the spirit of Christian personalism. And he thought he saw in medieval Christendom a way in which there could be a meeting place for, out of tolerance for any and every every people, and 
the culture, as long as they transcended tribalism and appreciated that we're meeting face to face as persons, and that that's the Erasmian legacy. Etienne Gilson, who wrote that book, The Unity of Philosophical Experience, I mentioned earlier, uh, he had called himself an, an Erasmus follower. He was a follower of St. Thomas, but he also called himself an Erasmian because he thought that uh, Western Christendom provided that personalist groundwork to provide uh, a way in which society can get along. And Erasmus thought of that if um, we quit putting our lamp under a bushel and really asserted that kind of Christian personalism, we could reform Europe, overcome wars. He became kind of a pacifist about it. So kind of a medieval universalism, you might call it. But that, as I said earlier, got deconstructed. And in the name of, as John was saying, rationalistic science, humanism today only has an echo of Erasmus. It's something else. And as I said earlier, it's really atheism. Which well, sometimes it's plus, called plus rationalism. Plus STEM. Plus STEM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. that's right. Well, the education system is part of the story. Because one of the things that's happened is scientific education has been co-opted by, not by science, but by what I would call scientism, which is a, an atheist worldview smuggled in as somehow axiomatic for scientific education. So when a student goes to a science class today, often they're taught, often subliminally, sometimes the faculty themselves, I don't think, realize they're doing this, but they're taught that in order to be an enlightened or scientifically minded person, you have to be an atheist. And if you're not an atheist, you're not only unscientific, you could actually be anti-scientific. If you read the works of these new atheists, people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens and the like, that is basically their text, that anyone who opposes atheism is just anti-science, which is just silly. But they, what they've done, they've taken scientism and replaced it and replaced science with it. And that's I modern a, humanism. i got a couple of footnotes that I want to uh, propose. Footnote number one on Erasmus. Did he do uh, work in theology? Yeah, he saw himself very much as a devout practicing Christian. Uh, there's the old, but he he had certain liberal tendencies. You know, that old, old saying that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. So <laughs> he's uh, created certain. Um, theological interpretations and tendencies, um, which got away from subsidiarity, as I understand it. He started thinking more in terms of the global Christian condition, and one of the reasons for that, because he wanted to, as I said, he wanted to seek this medieval universalism. But yeah, he now, was a, Now, I, I wouldn't bet my last dollar on this, because I already bet that last dollar, and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> had, I, had I still had... Were I to still have my last dollar, it seems to me, I read not so very long ago, in a book uh, by Eamon Duffy, who's a, a writer on church history, that when uh, uh, King Edward came in, and then mm -hmm. it reinforced when Queen Elizabeth came in, uh, the parishes, the parishes uh, throughout England were required to buy a book by Erasmus. And it was a, a kind of a commentary or a paraphrase uh -huh. of Scripture. Okay. Does that ring any bells with you, or is, is that something I'd better do some <clears throat> digging on? Yeah, I know um, that I'm not familiar with that, but it wouldn't surprise me because uh, one of the things Erasmus tried to do was to reach out to the different nationalistic tribes in Europe and try to bring them together. <laughs> and so maybe he was looking for a way to um, find a meeting place for all minds with a document. Yeah, like so that. it wouldn't be that uh, there'd be books by Luther that would be required in Anglican parishes, but a book by Erasmus, that's a different thing. Oh, I see. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, here, and then I want to encourage Mario and John to get back into this. 
Suppose somebody, uh, and I think uh, because I'm on the West Coast, we have such a strong Asian presence. Suppose somebody said, well, China has as much uh, right to, to claim being the birthplace of humanism as does, does Europe, uh, if we were really familiar with Chinese literature in the way that we pretend that we're familiar with mm-hmm. uh, European literature, we would see all sorts of parallels. Uh, fact is that for a long period of time, if you wanted to go anywhere in the Chinese civil service, you had to pass exams in poetry. Mm-hmm. So could we say that the East has, has had its own experience with humanism as well? Well, yeah, certainly in the broad sense. I don't know if Mario or John want to weigh into that. Wow. I, oh, they're pausing. They're gathering their <laughs> thoughts. All I'd, right, hit it. <laughs> well, I'd, weigh, I'd, I'd say this about it, that that element of personalism seems to be more distinctive of Western or Christian humanism because the East has always had a little ambivalence about the status of the person. You know, in Buddhism, um, the, the person, the self, is the source of suffering. Um, as long as you hang on to your ego in some way, you will suffer. And Nirvana or Satori or whichever Buddhist principle you want to invoke, or whatever Buddhist nomenclature you want to invoke, uh, that's a way in which you ultimately transcend yourself and you annihilate yourself. But in Christianity, that's, the very that's center, something that the Dalai Lama does not share with Western audiences. Okay, yeah, yeah. Doesn't get into that. Don't go there. <laughs> I just want to be a fuzzy koala bear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. Well, that's uh, that's the thing that um, the personalism is is um, a, a question there. But it, so you may have a humanism in another sense. Mario, you gotta gotta push us along now. Well, yeah, um, I have been uh, listening carefully. Uh, very interesting. Um, I have this question or a comment, if you will, um, around I think it was 1942, 1943. Uh, Jack Martin wrote a, a book. Uh, I think he, he he wrote earlier, but he published in English the Twilight of Civilization, right. where he said something uh, along these lines. Say, well, human history um, happened um, in in very uh, very odd ways. Um, because sometimes uh, uh, when you see the first rays of, dawn, of of a dawn, they're always mingled with the twilight. And he said, we are living those times. Um, he was talking yeah. about 1942, 1943, in the midst of the war. He was mm-hmm. in the United States and so on. <clears throat> uh, and yet, at the same time, he said something that uh, caught my attention all the way. He said, well... We need to build or rebuild our civilization, which was completely, at least, uh, taken by the Nazis and so on. And so we need to be prepared. And in order to be prepared for this new age, he talked about new humanism. In other words, it seems that for him, humanism or Christian humanism, as we understand, precede the renewal of uh, civilization. Now, Good. given that uh, chronological <laughs> sequence of uh, this, to, uh, this claim, so humanism, Christian humanism, precede the renewal, renewal of civilization, I have a couple of questions that, uh, do you think we are living uh, at least in our time uh, similar events that he described in then, and is that really possible? Do we have, uh, can we have the hope that that may happen given uh, 
the fact that the educational system in the West is anything but Christian humanist. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem, and Mary Chan saw this. He suspected that higher education had become a way in which you disorder the student's mind with atheism, and then you deconstruct Western civilization. He worried that that's what education had become. So in this way, in order to bring back that dawn out of the twilight, one has to reassert, Mary Tan thought, Christian personalism. And one does that by not letting the, the deconstructionists deconstruct Christianity, but the Christian needs to deconstruct scientism, which I mentioned before, which is scientism is a worldview which really has four elements, four perspectives in it. There, there's an excellent summary of this by a Danish philosopher named Mikael Stenmark, and he's, he says that scientism, which masquerades as science, but isn't the same thing because scientism is a philosophical point of view about reality, Whereas science is just an attempt to study the behavior of matter and doesn't make claims about what, metaphysically, what reality is as a whole. But scientism does, and it smuggles in as an atheism into scientific education. And Stenmark says that scientism is fourfold. It's, first of all, you have ontological scientism, which is the view that the only thing that can exist is matter. And then there's epistemological or epistemic scientism, the view that the only thing that can be known is what's known through the methods of physical science, physical scientific method. And then the third is axiological scientism, the view that um, human moral life is explained basically by Darwinian evolution, that we have Darwinian adaptations and that's why we get along. Morality is no more than that. And then the fourth kind of, of scientism is uh, existential scientism, the view that in the end there is salvation through science, physical science alone. So in, with such a worldview, there's no place for religion, there's no place for metaphysics, there's no place for morality as traditionally understood. This is a whole new paradigm. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. People like Mary Tan and Jill Sloan saw that. But it's very, very palpable today in the way education takes place in the schools. You send your child to a the university today, they're going to get a large dose of this scientistic, this propaganda masquerading as science, which is really scientism. And they can be forearmed and prepared for that, but that's part of the story, no doubt about it. So what you are saying then, we are trapped in a way that the educational system uh, is giving us this uh, propaganda, you said, of the scientism. And yet we need the education in order to develop or liberate a human person. And so then the public educational system or the university, university educational system uh, perhaps is not the place where we can start this, um, this new revolution of a new uh, humanism. My... Mm -hmm. That my write about my observations, or yeah, I think well, that's why we need really trained people who are aware of the differences between something like just ordinary scientific education. We all have to celebrate science, as I said. Physical science is the study of the behavior of matter. And look what wonders and what knowledge it's brought us. But that's not the same as justifying the claim that the only thing that exists is matter in motion, and that atheism then becomes the same as science. And we need people who are trained to reassert the classical philosophy can expose the, the shallowness and the error of, of scientism. <clears throat> and that alone would do a lot to reform education. But you need trained people who reassert metaphysics. Like, for example, ontological scientism, the only thing that exists is, is matter. You know, Carl Sagan in that famous series he did, Cosmos, that's the first thing he said in it. You know, right. uh, you looked up the cosmos, yeah. The cosmos, all that ever was, is, and shall be. You know, that's just a dogmatic assertion. It's, it's dogmatic. They don't prove that. But you, see, uh, that show was put together for seventh graders. So a seventh grader hears that and says, well, there's a great scientist, Carl Sagan, saying that. So in order to be a scientist, you must be an atheist. And it's just left at that. It's just a, a kind of a rhetoric. It's just a kind of propaganda. 
it can easily be exposed. All you have to do is show that uh, you can't explain human life in terms of, of physics alone. Uh, he, the human life is more than just neurology. Human, the human thought is more than just neurology. And the existence of things cries out for a metaphysics of theism. You can use Aquinas' five ways to prove the existence of God. And ontological scientism is eliminated in one fell swoop. And so with the other kinds of, of scientism, the idea that all we are just Darwinian creatures. I, I asked this of some of these Darwinians like um, Richard Dawkins and others who say that moral life is explained purely in terms of Darwinian adaptation. Well, I want them to ask me, answer me this. If cruelty is adaptive, does that make it right? Morality is not just about adaptation. Morality is about what's right and what's wrong. And adaptation doesn't tell you that. Adaptation might tell you that we had some genetic changes that enable us to cooperate, but that doesn't tell us that that's right. There's, there's something deeper to, to morality than just that. And so what, what they do, they just take this animal model of the human person, uh, biology, and they take that as their paradigm. And that, too, has to be challenged because the human person is much more than that. And moral life is uh, diminished if one doesn't challenge it. One thing that uh, is helpful in in the work, and it's a it's a big job that that you're sketching for us, is that we have uh, philosophers who are themselves scientists, right? And that we have top level scientists who are themselves philosophers. Uh, Somebody that I think very highly of, young, a young American who teaches at Providence College in, mm-hmm. in Rhode Island, is Nicanor Ostriaco. Nicanor Ostriaco, oh. who's done a lot of writing, a lot of uh, writing about evolution, what aspects of it are promising and what uh, distortions of it are truly dangerous. And Ostriaco's work is readily available online. And uh, Ah, he teaches college students at Providence and takes them to major conferences. And he takes them as, as a Dominican in his Dominican... Uh, robes, and he tells the story of how conference after conference, someone will approach his students and say, does your teacher believe in evolution? And the students will say, uh, in effect, he believes in following the evidence, but evidence Mm -hmm. is evidence for something, and you've got to be clear about what the proposition is that you think that the Mm -hmm. evidence is actually Mm -hmm. supporting. And uh, Ostriaco himself is, is theologically astute. Now, this is a digression. His background yeah. is uh, Filipino, and the new general of the Dominican order is a Filipino, first ever. Interesting. Which in, in a way of a association of ideas, never mind David Yu, but... Uh, mm-hmm calls to mind how the church is itself more and more international in outlook and perspective. Right. And and I think uh, that we we can look to draw on sources uh, that we might not have anticipated in the past, but we very much can now. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, uh, here's just another uh, index of this. In the United States, and certainly in California, the Claritian order has played a really significant role. I've taught Claritian seminarians in the past. If today, at least the last time I checked it out, you go to the uh, website of the Claritian order, it's in the mm-hmm. Philippines. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I, I think one aspect, a positive aspect of what is generally referred to as humanism 
is that it is international in scope. Yes, that, right. That's because one aspect the, of it. It's a positive aspect. That's the but, Erasmian uh, paradigm, the Erasmian yeah. hope. That we but, but, the person but now, everywhere. Let me ask you this. Uh, if our educational system is largely scientific in its structure, uh, and if, in fact, we can't really look for uh, uh, a, a, a vision of uh, uh, Christian humanism coming from that context, uh, then what about the chances for a Christian democracy? Mm -hmm. Most people are educated in a scientific framework, and that limits their humanism in a, a disastrous way. So also, most people then, as political participants, are uh, restricted by their their own restrictive version of humanism. So what's the what's the prognosis for democracy given the kind of educational system we have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, John Paul II, John Paul the Great, Saint John Paul the Great, he addressed that. He said you you have to reassert the mystery of the person back in education and explain that the world that modern students live in is only possible because of the Christian legacy about the human person we're talking about the western world at least uh, both Mary Tan and Stanley Yockey talked about this Stanley Yockey spent a lot of time in his books explaining that the only reason physical science exists is because of Christianity because of Judaism and Christianity <clears throat> physical science tried to plant itself in every ancient culture and it succeeded in the Christian West which was compared to other cultures during the Middle Ages was pretty much a backwater why did it why did it take root there? And it's because the Christian worldview was a creationist worldview. Uh, other theologies tended to see the world as a deterministic, eternal, just series of events, one thing happening after another necessarily. And it would there's this doctrine of the eternal return, and it would happen over and over, and it's hard, it's hard to find meaning in such a world. But the Christian view of the world is that God didn't have to create the universe. He did. He created it with his own intentions and designs. So some, some of that is mysterious to us. And he has a, um, an end in mind for He has a destiny in, in mind for this drama of natural history and puts human beings in this drama of natural history and wants us to exercise our own individual histories and destinies. <clears throat> and in a world like that, then it's an open question. Uh, hypothetical and experimental method makes sense because you you can't second guess what um, you, you can't prejudge what God has done, which is what the old theologies used to do. Whenever um, science tried to rear its head in history, it was snuffed out by the theologians because well we don't need that because we theologians know that the universe is deterministic and eternal. We don't need people running experiments as if the universe is an open question to a hypothesis. But in Christianity, it was an open question because God didn't have to create the universe. He created it with his own cryptic designs, and now let's run experiments and find out. St. Thomas's great teacher was St. Albert the Great, and he was a proto-scientist. In late medieval times, this came up, and they were encouraged to do this. Science was not something that threatened theology. It was constitutive of Christian theology. And Mary Tan points out the whole idea of modern democracy, because, Dr. Hennick, you mentioned democracy. Mary Tan says the whole idea of modern democracy was able to um, get momentum because of the work that medieval monks did in monasteries studying the nature of the Trinity. So for centuries, they would pour over the uh, and contemplate what, it, what is the triune God, and then eventually it became understood, well, wait a minute, you know, God is a person, a community of persons, and we are persons made in the image and called to the likeness of God, then we have significance because of that, and that should manifest itself in our politics and our government. And so the whole idea of inalienable human rights, God-given rights, really began eventually to threaten the whole idea of the divine 
right of kings and all of that. So science and democracy exist because of Christian personalism. Ideas have consequences, and the greatest ideas center on the incarnation. <laughs> right, exactly. And so we have to have philosophers and educators trained to assert this with courage. Remember, Aristotle says courage makes all the other virtues possible. And what we've had for so long is this kind of embarrassed Christianity where people don't realize the power and the treasure of Christian wisdom that can call all this into question. Uh, scientism is actually a very flimsy worldview that can be dismissed in one hour in a classroom by a trained philosopher. But nobody does that because they're intimidated by the the, uh, the dominance of that worldview in the academy. And they muzzle and themselves. And if it's uh, the case that we're in dire need of more courage, we're equally <laughs> in dire need of prudence understood as right reason and acting as opposed to right reason and dithering or stalling <laughs> or establishing right. new committees. Yeah. Doing the right thing at the right time. The yeah. Right now, you, you mentioned John Paul II, and, and he famously says that when we lose sight of God, we, we lose sight of man. We lose sight of God. We lose sight of the human and it seems to me that this was certainly the case with Marxism, but there's a kind of doctrinaire capitalism in which it seems to me to be equally the case. Man is understood as an economic actor and as an economic actor motivated almost exclusively by self-interest. And I think uh, that kind of economism is reductive of the human person. Yes. And and here here's another. Uh, in fancy talk, there's something called biocentric equalitarianism. Yeah. <laughs> and this is oftentimes associated with Peter Singer, but many other thinkers right. as well. Uh-huh. And the idea would be, there's nothing special about being a human being simply because of species. What's right. important is, well, what an individual X of whatever species, uh, mm-hmm. whatever that individual X of whatever species, whatever that that X has as an interest, as a desire, uh ought to be given equal consideration with X member of any other species. So, Mm -hmm. well, not only do pigs not fly, they're not interested in voting. (laughs) So we don't have to talk about voting rights for pigs, but pigs are certainly interested in staying alive, so we shouldn't eat them, right? Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Yeah. And so whatever interests a particular individual in a given species has, Those interests should be treated with the same respect as the interests of uh, any other member of any other species. Mm -hmm. And so you go from a kind of cuddly, I love my bunny uh, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, (laughs) animal orientation to uh, something like biocentric equalitarianism. And you have the same thing with gender ideology. Uh, what, what's this about being that kind of a human being, a, a male right. or a female? What really counts is what your interests are, what your desires are. And being yeah. a male at birth or a female at birth, well, you know what? That's really pretty much like being French at birth or German at birth. <laughs> yeah, I was German at birth, but I decided to move to France or someplace else like um Santa Monica, California, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you have the, the gender ideology, and, and now, and I think at this point still, the majority of people are appalled by it, this this notion of transhumanism. Right. Uh, gee, if I have this artificial part and that artificial part, might not the mm-hmm. whole be better if it were artificial? And does that sound bad? No, you can transcend the narrow biological species membership that you have now. 
Right. Well, all of these, I think, economism, biocentric, equalitarianism, gender ideology, transhumanism are, are powerfully, uh, increasingly powerful expressions of a loss of uh, understanding of what it is to be a human person. Yeah. And if we can uh, see their their similarities, I think we'll be in a better position to address their their perils. Mm-hmm. Well, you said it before. Uh, you quoted Richard Weaver's book, Ideas Have Consequences. And when you see this kind of thing happen, uh, my interest in philosophy has always been the history of philosophy. So I've always been fascinated by tracing back the genesis of ideas, which seem very, very contemporary, that they've actually been developed over time because of some original philosophical error. And going back um, several centuries, back in late medieval times and early Renaissance times, there was this philosopher named William of Ockham who said that we don't know if there are natures out there because our mind is, doesn't have the capacity to draw information from the external world. We have ideas in our mind that are natures, but they appear to be just uh, cryptic constructions. We're not sure where they come from. Maybe they're just put there by God. And this, see, that the, the classical idea, Aristotle and Aquinas, their view was that our senses put us in contact with physical things, real, extramental things, mind-independent realities. And our senses get information from those, and our intellect abstracts natures from those, so that we see that there are natures in the external world. We know that because our senses put us in contact with us, with them, and our intellect has an insight into that. And so we, uh, and the classical view was that there are natures, there are real natures, and the human mind is equipped to know those natures. But see, once Occam's view that that all ideas are are just constructions in our mind. In fact, John Locke said that the only objects of things that we know are our own ideas. We don't know the external world. It's just a kind of guesswork. And so this has consequences ultimately, where we don't know there are natures. So eventually people say, well, we don't know there are natures. Let's just reinvent or invent nature. And so once you get away from this classical, realist, common sense view of how we know our world, there are no natures, then you've got this kind of craziness that we have today where people just get to invent nature as they want. I'm going to identify today as a woman. This morning I woke up as a man. So what's to stop me? You're going to interfere with my self-expression and my freedom if you tell me I can't do that. And you've got a whole... On my, uh, on system my last trip to the doctor for the annual... Uh, Duly insured wellness checkup. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. well, <laughs> I was I was given a form that that asked me what what sex I was identified as being at birth, and so I wrote in, <laughs> "Ask the admissions committee." <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, good answer. I'll remember that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all a political construction, you see. It's, there's yeah, no and, and there's so no any, any patient, and this is a Catholic hospital system, Providence, <laughs> any patient that goes in for uh, a yearly checkup is going to be given a form that right. asks them what sex they were assigned at birth. Mm-hmm. And... You know, the law teaches, and so do forms that we routinely fill out. (laughs) And what the law teaches, it better be good, and what the forms teach, it better be good. But that form teaches what's bonkers. At the same time, there's something that, that we can't lose sight of, and that's that creation involves, of course, and it's coming to be on the side of God, but... In, right. in creatures and in natures, a, a profound element of mystery. It, right. it, it's not the case that if you're a realist, you're somehow going to deny the mystery of everything that is. And while yeah. we can know things and we can know their natures, we can't know their essences through and through. Exactly. Uh, and and this idea that that, that somehow... We can dominate all of nature, 
and and yeah. we can make it serve us. Uh, I think loses track of of the importance of the, the <clears throat> mystery of creation. Right. Now, isn't it Thomas who says we can never know all there is to know, even about a grain of sand? Right. He says we don't even know the essence of a housefly. He says, or yeah. you know, like, is that impoverished? But yet we have a science of entomology. So we know something about insects. Yes. Know insects are not the same as trees, for example. So we do know yes. something. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank goodness for that. Let's hang, let's hang <laughs> on to it. Mario, you've let us rant and rave here. Mm-hmm. Tell us some more. Well, um, um, listening to you, I think the struggle that we are facing today, if we want to use that word, is not between humanism and Christianity uh, is rather uh, a struggle between two conceptions of humanism or the mm-hmm. scientism and the scientist humanism and the Christian humanism. And so, and I think this is what uh, generally um, is called the, the anthropocentric uh, humanism, the theocentric humanism. But my question is more practical in, in, in the sense that if, uh, again, the educational system is permeated by this uh, um, very scientific humanism, what do you, how do you help young people? Uh, you are in a public school, uh, you have a freshman class, all the ideas are there, which is a very wild range of ideas. And how do we help these young people discern what a true humanism is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, my experience has been that the students in your class have a sense that they're being lied to, that the base also sense that the culture, they don't have enough historical perspective to see it clearly that they sense that there's something in the culture that's coming off the rails, and they're scared for themselves and their own future. So I find them very responsive to this kind of conversation, but they don't get it because there's only a minority of people who are trained to address it, and as I said before, it takes a certain courage to do it because students are going to go outside and say, hey, did you hear what Dr. Hancock did today? He said there's something wrong with science. Of course, I never would have said that. I was careful to make the distinction between science and scientism. But, you know, you you run these risks, so a lot of people just won't go there. But that's what we need. We need brave, um, trained philosophers who will get back to the classical foundations of education. And the students will be receptive to that. And they'll celebrate the fact that you you dismantle scientism in one hour in a classroom. Because they'll go to their next class, and it will be put forward, and they'll be able to see through the sham. Well, I don't think that would ever happen at Loyola Marymount University. <laughs> that's, that's the <laughs> problem. For 40 where years, these, I was a wage slave. No, it, it where could these happen. Coming from, but it could happen with a whole lot of luck. Let's <laughs> say providence, it, it could happen. Yeah. But there, there are so many issues to address. One is that in the philosophy department at Loyola Marymount University, the, the great majority of the classes are taught by adjunct professors. Yeah. And adjunct professors know very well that whether they're going to continue depends on external economic factors. And they also mm-hmm. know that whether or not they're going to continue it depends on so, student evaluations. And so, they also right. know that whether or not they're going to continue depends on what they say to administrators. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, the, the, the dean of liberal arts, the dean of liberal arts at a, a faux Jesuit university like Loyola Marymount it has a, right. a, a Jewish background and is a professed atheist and at one point was a right. volunteer for Planned Parenthood. Yeah, uh, so and not pluralism. only is that the case, that, <laughs> but when she was under consideration for hiring, mostly alums uh, got together a petition against her being hired that had over 1,300 signatures. Mm-hmm. Never acknowledged. Yeah. And yeah. so I know of a brilliant young philosopher who has just gone to Loyola Marymount University and 
what I would say to her and others in her situation is get ready for missionary work because that's exactly what you're going to be engaged in. That's the most exotic mission field is the university today. I yep. tell people that. You want to earn your stripes as a, your street cred as a missionary? Go teach at a university as a Christian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As an overt Christian. So. Well, so. Uh, I have a friend who said this is as bad as it was in ancient Rome, but then over the long haul, we did pretty <laughs> well there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> But it's a, it's yeah, a long, a bloody haul, I, <laughs> I think. Well, was, you can't rely right. on the institutions the way you used to. That's the problem. Yeah, and that that might be why Dr. Hancock has done so much work on homeschooling. <laughs> and uh, I found a great home there at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. People like Sebastian Mafu, you see, leadership, as you were saying, Jim, means so much. And that's um, we have yeah. people who realize the culture needs reform and and they can address that all right well our motto here on this program is forward lurch yeah i like that (laughs) we're gonna go forward even if we lurch and we always end in a prayer (laughs) uh the gospel from today's liturgy friday the 16th is from matthew Some Pharisees approached Jesus and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? He said in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. They said to him, Then why did Moses command that the man give the woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? He said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, and marries another, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If that is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. He answered, Not all can accept this word, but only those to whom that is granted. Some are incapable of marriage because they were born so some because they were made so by others, some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. Whoever can accept this ought to accept it. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks to all. We'll be back for another podcast next week. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.